2019. The Mississippi State Department of Health put out an alert after the state's poison control center has seen a rise in calls from people who have taken the drug. The FDA says treating COVID-19 with it could be very harmful when not prescribed. What this highlights is just the profound cost of health misinformation. If you get COVID-19, we actually do have treatments that work from steroids uh, to monoclonal antibodies and other treatments, but ivermectin is not one of them. The FDA says topical forms of ivermectin are approved for human use by prescription only for the treatment of some external parasites. Officials say the best protection we have against COVID-19 is a vaccine. A Kaiser Family Foundation report says hospitalizing unvaccinated people is costing the U.S. health system billions of dollars. The report details the average hospitalization cost at about $20,000, with government data showing more than 100,000 hospitalizations could have been prevented in June and July. The report says more than $2 billion could have been saved in those two months if those patients had been vaccinated. The foundation says these figures are likely an understatement of the entire burden on the health care system. An update now in Santa Maria. The city's country club is hosting its inaugural cross industry golf tournament. The tournament was organized by Econ Alliance, a nonprofit dedicated to building awareness, advocacy and appreciation for northern Santa Barbara County industries and communities. Today's golf tournament benefits the company's STEM and workforce development programs. Sponsors for the tournament contributed thousands of dollars to help the nonprofit's programs. I think this is a really important effort for us. We've had uh, a struggle, you know, trying to raise enough money for our STEM and workforce programs, and this will help us immensely. Sponsors for the golf tournament were able to sponsor holes on the golf course and events. Teams representing different industries, including agriculture, energy, healthcare, wine, and tourism, competed for bragging rights until 2022. 17 Strong is hosting a movie night fundraiser this Saturday at Thousand Hills Ranch. Gates open at 630 for the community to come and enjoy Disney's cars. Tickets are $40 per car. Families are encouraged to bring blankets and chairs to watch the movie on the grass. Proceeds will go towards 17 Strong's mission of sending 18 to 40 year olds on trips after they battle a serious illness. People have gone to Hawaii, Dominican Republic, Greece, all over the world, wherever you can think of. Um, and basically, these trips are just a way for these survivors to kind of decompress after going through such a hard time in their lives and celebrate the end of their illness journey, as well as just get some closure from such a crazy, hard time in their life. 17, 17 Strong has provided nearly three dozen victory trips since 2017. This week marks the 17th annual KSBY's Be A Hero Blood Drive. The Blood Drive is Wednesday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the Vitalant locations in San Luis Obispo and Santa Maria. Donors will receive free tacos, a gift certificate for ice cream, and a t-shirt. Appointments can be made online ahead of time by visiting this story at KSBY.com. There are currently more available appointments in Santa Maria. And Delaney's here in for Dave with a preview of the weather forecast. Going to warm up, I take it? Yeah, things are warming up as we get later into the week. But first, here's a look at Shell Beach earlier today. Thanks to Surfline.com. Looks like it was pretty nice out there. And I'll have more weather coming up. Also coming up, the California Department of Justice has finished a four-year probe into the Bakersfield Police Department. The results from investigators. Plus flooding and storm damage in the eastern U.S. over the weekend. A look at recovery efforts from Tropical Storm Henri. Balance Treatment Center. Following this weekend's flash floods, 21 people are dead and at least 10 more missing in Tennessee. And cleanup is underway in the northeast following Tropical Storm Henri. Chris Pallone has more on the extreme summer weather. Across southern New England, a day of assessing damage and cleaning up. This looks like the worst. This is the worst. Henri made landfall Sunday in Rhode Island as a tropical storm. In its wake, trees and power lines down and flash floods throughout the region. Parts of New York and Pennsylvania drenched. Nearly 100 people had to be rescued from rising water in New Jersey. This part of the state got crushed. Here in Boston, Massachusetts, the threat not over just yet. The remnants of Henri will dump more rain over southern New England before moving out to sea tomorrow. Meanwhile, in Middle Tennessee. The last flood in 2010 was supposed to be the 100-year flood, and it wasn't anything compared to this, nothing. The hunt for the missing continues in Humphreys County after a summer deluge Saturday washed away everything in its path. We're going to need help. People are devastated. And, and how, how do you recover this? I mean, I mean, there, there's people that their whole lives are gone. A question on the minds of so many after a weekend of destructive weather.
Chris Pallone, KSBY News. Good evening. Pretty nice day out there. Mild temperatures and sunshine, as we can see from our Pismo Surfline camera. Lots of people out enjoying that nice weather at the beach today. Our forecast headlines showing some below average temperatures on parts of the central coast today, but we will see temperatures gradually warming up as we get later into the week. And tonight we will see some low clouds and fog, especially out in those coastal areas. Now our fire and smokes over here in the red, you can see where, um, where some of the fires are burning across the state right now. And yesterday we had some light smoke just south of Santa Barbara, all the way north of Paso Robles. Right now we are back to looking at pretty thick smoke in the air here on the central coast. But the good news is, if we look at our forecast, we don't see a whole lot changing with the smoke here in the Central Coast area. Most of it's in the northern and southern parts of the state. Fog tracker showing some low clouds moving down along the Central Coast this evening. Peak or current wind speeds 19 miles per hour in Paso Robles, 10 in San Luis Obispo, 17 miles per hour in Shandon, 19 in California Valley, and 19 in Cuyama. Current temperatures, as usual, a little bit warmer inland, 83 in Cuyama, 78 in California Valley, 73 degrees in Shandon, 72 in Paso Robles. And then as we move out toward the coast, we see those cooler temperatures, 66 degrees in Cambria, 71 degrees in San Luis Obispo, 66 in Santa Maria, and 69 degrees in Santa Barbara. Our peak wind speeds today, all in the double digits, 13 miles per hour in Santa Barbara, 19 in Santa Maria, 16 in Santa Inez, 24 in Paso Robles and 11 miles per hour in San Luis Obispo. So another pretty breezy day in Paso today. Avila Beach 805 webcam showing a pretty nice scene out there tonight. Sun is starting to set currently 63 degrees, 17 mile per hour winds. Santa Barbara also looking like a nice evening, 69 degrees currently. San Luis Obispo, 71 degrees, traffic moving right along this evening. Now looking ahead at our coastal valley, starting off the day a little cooler tomorrow in the 50s, 51 degrees at 7 a.m., but getting into the 70s by the early afternoon. Interior Valley starting off the day with some clouds, but they will clear by the early afternoon, getting into the 80s, 84 degrees for the high by 3 p.m. The south coast also starting the day off a little bit cooler, 59 degrees at 7 a.m. with some clouds, but those clouds showed clear by the early afternoon, 75 degrees for the high. West Beach is also looking at a sun cloud mix, not a lot of variation in temperature throughout the day, starting the day at 57 degrees, ending the day at 61. 24 hour temperature change, one degree in San Luis Obispo, one in Santa Maria, two in Santa Barbara. Our area forecast showing a high of 83 in Paso Robles, 76 in San Luis Obispo, 71 in Santa Maria, and 72 degrees in Santa Barbara. 86 in San Miguel, 79 in Atascadero, 62 San Simeon, 64 in Cambria, 59 in Cayucas, and 64 degrees in Morro Bay. So definitely a little bit cooler out toward the coast. Shandon, 83 degrees, 87 in California Valley. Cuyama, 88 degrees, Carpentria, 69. And our seven day forecast is showing things warming up in Paso Robles as we get later into the week. San Luis Obispo also warming up as we get later into the weekend, 81 degrees for the high. Seven day forecast showing Santa Maria warming up just a bit as well, 78 degrees for the high this weekend in Santa Barbara, 72 degrees for the high on Tuesday, getting all the way up to 78 degrees for the high by the start of next week. That's all for weather. <laughs> all right, thank you. And Casey's here with a preview of sports. Well, after a delayed start to Rigetti's football season due to COVID-19, the Warriors are finally going to go get ready in week one. I caught up with Rigetti this afternoon to see how the team is preparing for Lompoc on Friday. And four candidates in the recall election will debate this week who is included and when you can watch. Hey Joe, Mondays this fall on NBC. The Regretti Warriors join in on the Friday Night Lights action this week in their first matchup against Lompoc. The Warriors had to cancel their game against Bishop Diego in Week 0 due to a positive COVID-19 case on the team, but the Warriors are finally ready to go for the fall season. We just kind of add to the list of adversity that, that we have to overcome, and we're ready to go. We're ready for all of the first game stuff that happens in, in every first game. We faced a lot of adversity through these last two years during the pandemic, so my mindset was just on our, on our guys. Good thing happened to good people. 
just keep working. And we've had to take a total of 13 days off since we began our season. So it's difficult to assess where we're at, but we had two really, really good practices last week. It gave me and my boys a lot of confidence and we just can't wait to get on the field. The Warriors are coming into the season with a strong core of leaders on the team, including four-year letterman Ryan Bovin. Well, without a doubt, you know, our, our go-to guy, our face of the franchise now is Ryan Bovin. Um, he's playing on both sides of the ball and he sets the tone at practice every day. Just the leaders that were set before us, just trying to just encourage our guys in the best way possible and lead by example. Bovin believes the athletic ability of this team is at an all-time high this fall. Our athletes for sure. Um, I don't think Rigetti class has ever been more uh, diverse in athletes. Rigetti will be put to the test on Friday against Lompoc, who beat Paso the Robles in their first matchup last Friday night. They are fast. They are absolutely fast, and they're really well coached. That kind of speed is impossible for us to simulate, but we're going to do the best we can. Giving 100 percent on every rep, you know, they're, they're fast. Um, we got athletes that I think can take good routes onto their, their fast guys, um, so we can hopefully make those make those tackles. It's playing our game, giving 100 percent every rep. My boys deserve a chance. That's that's all I know. Sportsmanship in its purest form on display this weekend as the major leaguers traveled to Williamsport to meet the Little Leaguers. Several of the Little League teams greeted the Los Angeles Angels and Cleveland Indians as they arrived at, Bo uh, at Bowman Field. Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, among others, took time to sign autographs and take selfies with the 11 to 13 year old All-Stars. Then it was time to enjoy Williamsport for all that it was, including the famous hill sliding in the outfield and a ping pong competition. The major leaguers remembering their little league days while the little leaguers enjoyed a night off from playing to watch their favorite players and dream of possibly becoming them one day. How cool is that? No. It's so nice that they took time out for that. That's awesome. Very awesome. Well, still ahead in our next half hour, President Biden has hinted that U.S. forces could remain in Afghanistan beyond that August 31st deadline, the latest on evacuations from Kabul. Plus, the Caldor fire continues to burn into a new milestone, while the CAL FIRE director says it is the number one priority in California wildfires. In tonight's fire watch, thousands of people have been evacuated east of Sacramento because of the Caldor fire. The fire broke out nine days ago and has already passed 100,000 acres with just 5% containment. Cal Fire officials say it is the number one priority in the nation of fires to get additional and new resources as it gets closer to the Lake Tahoe Basin. The heavy dead timber in the area is causing concern. One of the things that's been impacting a lot of these fires is the rollout that's been occurring, which is dead timber on fire. Uh, it's starting to roll down and it can cross over contain containment lines and ignite other vegetation along the path. Cal Fire Director Tom Porter said today that he does not think the fire will reach Lake Tahoe. He added he could be proven wrong as the Dixie Fire reached places he did not think was possible either. In Northern California, the Dixie Fire continues burning as the largest active fire in the U.S. More than 1,100 square miles have burned. That's almost a third the size of San Luis Obispo County. More than 1,200 structures have been destroyed. Containment is up to 40% today. Cal Fire officials say much quieter weather is expected to help crews this week. Farther south in Kern County, evacuation orders have been put out for parts of the area as the French fire continues to grow. Nearly 4,000 residents have been forced to evacuate so far. More than 800 firefighters are working on scene. The fire broke out last Wednesday and it has burned almost 14,000 acres. In the latest national news tonight, President Biden is signaling he may push back that August 31st deadline to get all U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. Alice Barr has more as allied forces are scrambling to get evacuees onto flights out of the Kabul airport. A deadly firefight at Kabul airport today highlighting the intense danger U.S. forces face as they work to evacuate as many Americans and allies as possible. We are trying to get Americans out wherever they may be in Afghanistan. Despite an elevated terror threat targeting the evacuation efforts, President Biden saying U.S. troops may need to remain in Afghanistan beyond the end of the month to keep getting people out. Our hope is we will not have to extend, but there are going to be discussions, I suspect, on how far along we are in the process. 
But the Taliban is warning the U.S. would be crossing a red line if it kept troops in the country beyond the self-imposed deadline of August 31st. That is the mission that would have been signed by the commander-in-chief assigned to us, and that's what we're trying to execute. The U.S. has helped evacuate roughly 37,000 people since the Taliban takeover began, more than 10,000 over the past 24 hours alone. They're being flown to two dozen countries, including Germany, where U.S. airmen helped an Afghan woman give birth in the cargo hold of this C-17 after she went into labor mid-flight. Some refugees have already made it to this processing center near Virginia's Dulles Airport. From there, they're being moved to Army bases across the country. But many, many more remain in Afghanistan waiting for their turn, guarded under perilous conditions for U.S. troops waiting for their own tickets home. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. The Biden administration is hoping a successful evacuation in the end could help redeem the chaotic withdrawal, but there are hurdles ahead. Roughly 50 refugees arrived in Virginia today from Afghanistan. After they are processed, the Afghans will be taken to either Fort Bliss in Texas or Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. The Pentagon is also working to identify additional temporary housing spaces. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy told President Biden his state is ready to welcome refugees. In a letter to the White House, Governor Murphy says he believes America's allies in Afghanistan could make enormous contributions to his state. The governors of more than a dozen states, including California, have publicly stated they are ready to assist in accepting refugees. On a visit to Asia, Vice President Kamala Harris visited a U.S. naval base in Singapore today. Singapore is one of America's strongest security partners in the region with deep trade ties. The country is home to the biggest port in Southeast Asia. Harris's visit addresses concerns over China growing more assertive in the area. The vice president toured the Navy ship USS Tulsa at the base in Singapore. She spoke to sailors about the U.S. military's efforts to assist the evacuation of thousands of people from Afghanistan. I just want to say that we are all grateful to those men and women in uniform and the embassy staff on the ground who are bringing safety to Americans and to the Afghans who work side by side with us and to other Afghans at risk. The U.S. and Singapore reached security agreements today to deploy military aircraft and warships there on a rotating basis. The U.S. Capitol Police officer who shot and killed Capitol rioter Ashley Babbitt on January 6th will not face any disciplinary action. The U.S. Capitol Police Department made the announcement today. Babbitt was one of many pro-Trump attackers that overran the Capitol that day. She was shot while trying to lead the mob through a broken window into the Speaker's lobby. U.S. Capitol Police said in a statement that the officer who shot Babbitt was following department policy. The department will not name the officer out of concern for the officer's safety. Today is New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's last day in office, and in his farewell address, he denies any improper behavior. I understand that there are moments of intense political pressure and media frenzy that cause a rush to judgment, but that is not right. It's not fair or sustainable. Facts still matter. Cuomo's top aides say he has no interest in running for office again. New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul will be sworn in at midnight tonight. California Department of Justice says the Bakersfield Police Department has been violating the rights of its residents. Investigators say they have evidence showing unreasonable force, including deadly force, was used toward people with mental health issues. A history of unreasonable searches and seizures was also uncovered. The civil investigation into the Bakersfield Department began in 2016 after numerous allegations of serious misconduct and excessive force. The chief of the Bakersfield PD denies the allegations but says new policies will be enforced. The California recall is three weeks away and some of the candidates will be in a debate this week. That debate will be broadcast right here on KSBY from 7 to 8 p.m. Wednesday night. Four candidates are scheduled to participate, including Republicans John Cox, Kevin Falconer, and Kevin Kiley, and Democrat Kevin Paffrath. If you have any questions for the candidates, you can submit them on our website, ksby.com. The debate will cause some programming changes for KSBY. Following the debate, America's Got Talent will begin at the usual time of 8 p.m., followed by Family Game Fight at 9. Jeopardy! will start at 10, and Wheel of Fortune will start at 10.30 before the news at 11. A record heat wave scorched the Pacific Northwest in July. Coming up, how those record temperatures affected farmers in the area and what it could mean for you at home.
And city officials in San Luis Obispo have started a project at Laguna Lake, what they hope to achieve with it. Sign up today. This summer has been one of the hottest on record for states across the U.S. For farmers, that's meant smaller harvests and profits. Alexa Liaco talked with farmers about the help they need to keep crops alive. This is Jackie Dyke's backyard, one filled with rows and rows of history. I am fourth generation on this farm. Every day growing up, this was her playground. Whether it's just riding along in a truck or riding along in a harvester in a buddy seat, it's kind of how it all began. Now this farm is hers. I love farming. I love watching things grow. But with her love for her berries, seeds, and other crops comes the struggle of helping them survive. This year, that job on our farm outside Portland, Oregon, became the toughest yet. We had the COVID-19 struggles. Coming into this year, though, everything was looking normal. Normal until a heat wave hit the Pacific Northwest, with temperatures above 115 degrees for days on end. The heat and UV rays during those three extreme days, it pretty much just singed the fruit. Jackie watched as her livelihood shriveled and died before her eyes. Every time we went to look, it was like more fruit was gone. Everything was out of our control. At least half of their crop for the year was destroyed in a matter of hours. It was it was really devastating. It it didn't really hit me until my dad said we worked all year, you know, on this that it just felt so heavy and the berries they could harvest weren't the same. What we picked, the fruit was small. Oregon produces 90% of the blackberries for the entire United States. And in just three days, 77% of the blackberry and raspberry crops all across this valley were destroyed by the heat. But it wasn't just the berries that were damaged. Along with dozens of crops, Christmas trees were hit too. Those were planted this year, a few of them last year, but they're pretty much all dead. Oregon is also the top producer for Christmas trees in the country. Jacob Hemphill's family farm saw at least $100,000 in losses. You know, a small guy like me, it's a big number. You know, the big guys, it's it's a bigger number, but it's all the same scale. It's been pretty stressful wondering what trees are going to make it, what trees aren't going to make it. His seedlings, the trees people would buy years from now, were destroyed. So my dad used to always tell me that Christmas trees were like people, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me growing up, you know. But now it does because he would say they're like people, you know, some die at a young age, some die at an old age. They're all different. Many of his older trees were damaged too. You can see that it, uh, you know, cooked it. it yeah, it's going to make a shortage, you know. So, we were just kind of coming out of an issue where there was a shortage of trees and now it's was looking better. But long term, yeah, there'll probably be a little hiccup in the road, but... We're going to make it through for sure. All of these losses mean higher prices for the consumer, a tough reality these farmers face to make a living. It's tougher this year, but we've had toughness. We've made it through it. You know, that's what we do. Farmers like Jacob and Jackie say they could really use extra assistance from the USDA to help their farms survive, and that could help keep prices lower for consumers too. We're not just saying we need money. We're saying we need agriculture to be valued, supported, and I hope that when people are shopping and they see blackberries that they buy USA. With more state and federal funding and support from shoppers across the country, these producers hope their family legacies can outlast the extreme weather. The goal is that this will be Dyke Family Farm forever. I'm Alexa Liaco reporting. And Delaney's in for Dave Hubdy with a preview of our weather forecast. Yes, warmer temperatures are on the way this week, but first let's take a look at Lake Nascimento earlier today. Thanks to 805 webcams, we can see those levels have dropped quite a bit, but still a nice day out there. I'll have more weather coming up. From daylight, home and patio. An update now in San Luis Obispo. Officials have begun the process of restoring Laguna Lake. City officials say the lake has accumulated naturally occurring contaminants like blue-green algae. They plan to dredge the lake every other year to improve water quality. The project will just be will cost just more than $700,000 and will be funded through local tax revenue. The city does not expect any closures at local parks or hiking trails. Construction to install a